Today's video is about organizing data in plots and graphs, specifically line plots, box and whisker plots, stem and leaf plots, and histograms. We're going to focus first with uh, a small group of data, it looks like 12 numbers, that, um, that have a, a very small range. You can see that the data, um, even though there's a lot of data here, um, the smallest number in the data set is 11 and the largest is 13. This data is not in order, so what we'd like to do is put this in order and see if there's any kind of uh, spread to that data as far as how, how it's distributed. So um, we're going to do a simple dot plot because our numbers are pretty close together. And what we'll do is we'll just uh, put a dot for each time the number occurs. Now, um, because my range is relatively small, a dot plot's a great choice here because when you make a dot plot, you make a number line and you must include every possible number. So if I uh, had a bunch of 11s and 13s and no 12s, the 12 would still need to be represented because it would show any clusters or gaps in the data set. So I'm going to just go ahead and put a dot for each of these. You can see 11, 12, 13, 13, 11, 11, 12, 11, 12, 11, 11, 13. You'll note that I tried to make all the dots right around the same size and have them about the same distance um, along the graph to make it very easy to compare and clearly see that 11 is the most popular answer in, in this situation. Um, it also now orders my numbers so I know that there are six 11s, three 12s, and three 13s um, in case I needed to find the median or the mode or any of those things. So um, we're going to now look at a different set of data and this set of data is much further spread apart. Um, one of the disadvantages of a line plot is because you must include every single number I wouldn't want to put this data in a line plot because my lowest data set number is 51 and my highest is 86. I don't want to include that many numbers in my data set um, in a line plot because my line plot will be over 20 numbers long. Instead, I'd want to organize this in a stem and leaf plot. Now, a stem and leaf plot organizes data by place value. And since my places start with a 5, a 6, a 7, or an 8, those would be my stems. And then my leaves would fill in. Um, so all the numbers that start with a 5, my 54, my 52, my 59, they don't go in this row. Um, and all my numbers that start with an 8, my 81, my 86, and my 80 would all go in this row. Um, so we're going to start the 60 would be plotted as a 0 here, and the 80 would be a 0 here. Even though both leaves are zeros, clearly this 0 goes in the 8 row, so it counts as an 80, and this counts as a 60. We'll continue to plot that data in here and you'll notice that I'm plotting it in the order that I'm reading it instead of trying to put it in order as I go. It's always a good idea when you're done plotting your data to count how much data you have. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 numbers. Notice I didn't count my stems because this data actually is 54, 52, 59, 54. I don't need to count that 5 because it's just telling me this. Now you'll note that I didn't have any data in the 70s. I still need to leave that 7 there under the same concept we use with that line plot is we, we, don't, we want to see if there's gaps. And there's clearly gaps in this data and that's important. Now I'm not yet done. I'm actually going to go ahead and make up my stem and leaf plot all over again and I'm going to organize the data from least to greatest. And so you can see I've got 1, 2, 4, 4, 8, 9. 1, 2, 4, 4, 8, 9. 0, 5, 6. And 0, 1, 6. Uh, you don't want to put a 0 here to hold that space because that would indicate there's 70 in our data set. And you'll note there is no 70 in our data set. It's also important for you to realize as you place these, this num these numbers in um, that Again, it's not a 2 here, it's a 52. So if I wanted to say, uh, answer these questions about the data set, um, you know, the greatest value is not this 9, because that's a 59. This would be the greatest value, 86. And again, if I wanted to identify how many um, values there are in this data set, I would count up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There are 12 values in this data set. Um, I wouldn't go ahead and count those stems. The least value would be 51. 
the median. Now the median is going to be right in the middle of my data set. So I could write them all out again, or I could recognize that there are 12 numbers in my data. So here's our sixth number, and then there's uh, this is my seventh number. So it would fall right between this 59 and 60. So the number that falls between that will be 59 and a half. My range, I'm going to subtract that greatest value, 86, and that smallest value, 51. You get a range of 35. And my mode, the number that appeared the most, now you can see those fours appeared the most times. Um, even though there were two sixes, they represent 66 and 86. So the mode actually would be 54. A lot of students commonly will say the mode here is 4, forgetting that that 4 is associated with the stem 5. All right, good. Um, the next type of graph we're going to deal with is a histogram. Now, a histogram is a special kind of bar graph that shows the frequency or the number of times the data occur within intervals. The bars in a histogram are connected rather than separated. That's different than what we've done with bar graphs in the past. Bar graphs show information about individual categories, whereas histograms group the categories together in intervals. We're going to create a histogram right now using this data. This is uh, data that shows um, the ages of people riding a roller coaster. You may remember this example from class. Now, as we go ahead and place this data in a histogram, we, we've already got our frequencies, or our intervals um, determined for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to just make a straight um, uh, y, uh, x axis here, and we're going to separate them into groupings. We need to get five groupings. And so my groupings are right here. I like to make those striations first so that I've got five equally spread apart um, items because that's going to be my guideline for my bars. Um, I know my nine, line's not super straight. I certainly could use a ruler or a straight edge to make that, um, but I want to be you know, realistic as far as what you guys are doing when you're making your graphs. Um, if we were doing a project where that was required, that would be the expectation, but for just making a quick um, representation, this is fine. Um, you're going to see our first interval, 10 to 19. 20 to 29, 30 to 39. You'll note that all of the intervals are the same amount of numbers. So there's 10 numbers in each interval. That's important for this data to truly be representative in a histogram. Now my uh, y-axis is going to come and meet at the origin here. And um, since my highest frequency is 16, uh, I'm going to count by twos here. So 0, 2, 4, 12, 14, 15. Usually a good rule of thumb. You want between uh, usually 5 or 10 or so intervals. You don't want to go a lot more than that unless, you know, with a histogram because you've got the ability to count by, uh, you know, 2s or 4s or 5s or 10s or whatever is best for you to kind of keep the data. Uh, you don't want to make, you don't want to count by, um, you know, 5s in a situation here, though, because it's going to be hard to graph your data. You know, counting by 2s is ideal here. So now um, I'm, I've done that. I need a heading here. Since this is showing um, ages of people riding a roller coaster, that's what I'm going to write as my title. Ages of people riding a roller coaster. You want to be careful when you write your title of a graph. The whole purpose of graphs is to make it easy to understand your data. Um, if you don't uh, make a title that's easy to understand, people might not know what it is you're talking about. Along the side here is going to be our frequency. Okay. And then along here is going to be the ages. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at our data, and there was 16 in the 10 to 19 range. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that line straight across here and use this as my marker to make sure that my bars are nice and, and uh, appropriately sized. I'm going to then, you can see I kind of fudged that to make sure it was nice and neat. Um, my 20 to 29 is 11 people, so I'm going to go right between that 10 and the 12 and kind of meet up here in the middle. The next group is 5, so I'm going to go between the 4 and the 6, and again, come straight up and meet. Uh, the fourth group is only 2, and then the last group is 4. And you can see, it's a nice, neat histogram. 
one of the drawbacks of uh, having the bars all connected is sometimes it's hard to tell where one bar begins and one bar ends. So it's highly recommended to color all your bars different colors or alternate which color is which. I'm not going to do this super neat, sorry to say, uh, but I'm just going to alternate the colors. You wouldn't do that on a standard bar graph because it would make it hard to indicate, um, you know, whether maybe uh, categories were related. Um, so you, you don't want to alternate on a regular bar graph. You would alternate um, as far as within categories for a uh, double bar graph or a triple bar graph. But with a standard bar graph, you'd want them all the same or all, or all different. But with a histogram, it's okay to alternate so that you can see. Um, if we had no data in our data set, you know, we'd, we'd see that because there will be no bar there at all. All right, so that's a nice little histogram, a quick uh, and easy uh, histogram showing the ages of people riding a roller coaster. Now, reading a histogram is important as well. Um, let's uh, take a close-up here, and you can see that the histogram shows people uh, and how many hours they slept. Um, to identify how many people participated in the survey, we're going to have to read the graph and recognize in the 0 to 3 grouping, there were 2. In the 4 to 7 grouping, there were 8. In the 8 to 11 grouping, there were also 8. And in the 12 to 15 hours grouping, three people slept 12 to 15 hours. To get the total number of people that participated, we'd add up all these numbers. So 8 and 8 is 16, plus 2 is 18, plus 3 is 21. So the answer would be 21 people. Now, which interval has the least number of values? Clearly, that's the bar that's the smaller. So in this case, the 0 to 3 interval is the uh, interval with the least number of values. How many people slept less than eight hours? A lot of people would make the mistake and assume that just this bar shows the people who slept less than eight hours. But it's clear that these people also slept less than eight hours. So you would add up the two and the eight and get an answer of 10 people. And as far as how many people slept at least eight hours, it would be the opposite. All of these people slept at least eight hours, and all of these people slept at least eight hours. So the correct, the correct answer here will be 11 people. Now, the last type of graph that we're making today is called a box and whisker graph. And the box and whisker graph uses five important pieces of information that you already know how to collect. Um, you're going to take a group of data. You can see we have eight numbers here. Um, these are donations made to uh, the local soccer association. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and organize that data in order from least to greatest. And I'm going to start um, by putting the data in order. 5, 8, 10, 10, 20, 20, 30, 50. And now that the data is in order from least to greatest, I'm going to find the middle of that data. That will be the, the median. Since there was no median in this data, I'm going to need to find the average or the mean of these two numbers. The number that comes right between them is 15. I'm going to write that off to the side because I'm going to need that to make my box and whisker graph. The next thing I'm going to do is to identify the lower extreme. The lower extreme is the lowest number in my data set. And that would be right here. Uh, sometimes we'll abbreviate that with an LE. Uh, and this median right here would be our 15. And our lower extreme is 5. Our upper extreme is the greatest number. I don't know what I'm doing here. The upper extreme would be 50. And then we're going to find um, that the quartile 1 and the quartile 3 are calculated by looking at the lower and the upper half of the data. Right here, this is the upper ha or lower half of the data. And so this is the middle of the, up the lower half of the data. And so that would be between 8 and 10 is 9. Quartile 1 is 9. Um, we, we label that with a Q with a um, subscript 1, and that would be 9. And then same thing here with the upper half of our data that comes directly in between here. And so quartile 3 would actually be 25. Now that we have all of that data, we can go ahead and make a box and whisker graph. Now, a box and whisker graph is calculated or is created with a number line. We're going to make our number line, and we're going to just go straight across. And we know our data needs to go from 5 all the way to 50. So I think counting by, uh, by tens will be fine for us. 
So I'm going to count by tens here. So this would be 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. You'll note that I use the striations on my ruler here. Okay. And so 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And now we're going to go ahead and identify the lower extreme is 5. Put that right here with a dot. The upper extreme is 50. We'll label that with a dot. Quartile 1 would be 9. I'm going to label that with a straight line. Um, the median is 15. We'll label that with a straight line. And upper quartile is 25. We'll label that with a straight line. We then join together the lines to make the box. Connect the whiskers to the box. And our box and whisker graph is complete. Now, a box and whisker graph is great for showing um, your median very quickly, easy to find where the middle of your data is. It also shows where the data is, how far it's spread out, and where the cluster of the data is. This represents 25% of the data, another 25% of the data, another 25% of the data, and the last 25% of the data, you can see, is very spread out. So the majority of the people who make that donation, 75% of those people are making donations of $25 or less. Um, only 25% of the people are making donations that are larger than that. All right, so um, now we're going to talk about how data can be spread out and how we can describe data that's spread out. Right here, you can see some data in a dot plot, and this shows a flat or uniform distribution. So six students were asked how many siblings they had. Everyone gave a different answer. That tells you that the data is very flat or uniform. It's, it's the same for everyone. Um, whereas, sometimes you'll ask a question, like uh, if you go back to that very first example I've given you, um, you can see this data right here, not flat or uniform, because you can see that there's a spike in this one section here. You can also have symmetric and skewed distribution. So if you've got symmetric distribution, um, you'll see that the left side of the graph is a mirror image of the right side of the graph. So I could actually draw a line straight down the middle here, and it's the same on both sides. Whereas when data is skewed left, you can see that um, the data kind of makes a hill and then kind of goes down the steps over here. Um, the tail of the data is here, okay? And so the tail extends to the left, we call it skewed left. So most of the data is actually on the right side of the graph, but it's actually called skewed left. Skewed right would just be the opposite of that. Again, the tail you can see, uh, if you put a marble up here, it would roll down here. Here it would fall off the cliff, but here it would roll. And it's rolling to the right, so it's skewed right. All right, and again, most of the data is to the left, but it's skewed right. So if we look at a couple more uh, dot plots here, you can see this dot plot. You can see this data, because of the way the hill is, would be skewed left. This dot plot shows data that would be symmetrical, because you can see it's the same on both the left and the right. You can actually talk about how data is skewed or not skewed with a histogram. In this histogram, you can see that that hill is written like that. So this histogram is skewed left. And in this histogram, it's skewed to the right. You can also do that with box and whisker graph. This box and whisker graph, you can see, is symmetrical. The median's right in the middle. Each box is the same size. And the distance on the whiskers is also the same size. Each 25% of the, the graph is equally distributed. This is a symmetric or symmetrical box and whisker graph. This box and whisker graph is not symmetrical. You can see most of the data is on the left, which means that your hill is actually going to the right. This would be skewed right. And this box and whisker graph would actually be skewed left. Because most of the data is on the right, it would be skewed left. That's the end of our uh, video on the distribution of data. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you do well on your test.